Okay, now the, the title is uh, kind of interesting because it's like a throwback from those old books. Remember those old books have long titles? So the, the title of my Darash is The Mosaic Proglostication of the Mosaic of Israel's Life. Long title, right? Okay, well, so what is a mosaic? I love word plays. Some of you know I love word plays. Uh, 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 mosaic refers to all things concerning Moses or Moshe, the Mosaic Covenant. So the first part of this is mosaic is everything would pertain to Moses. Well, then what is a mosaic? A mosaic is a pattern image made of small little stones or colored glass or stone or ceramic held together by mortar or plaster covering a surface. Now, these mosaics are often used in floor and wall decorations. Perhaps you've seen them in Israel. And they're particularly popular in the ancient Roman world. By the mosaic of Israel's life, I mean the pieces of colorful events past, present, and future, which are held in place by Hashem's provinces. So well, I have a picture of that in a minute here. Let's go on here. Employee of Israel's antiquities work shows this uh, mosaic here on the floor, discovered here in Israel. Is there a close-up of what that looks like? So, whoop, there we go. So uh, did Moses deliver a prognostication? Adonai revealed the future to Moses at one point. Before his death concerning the pivotal events which would take place of Israelites, he said this. Make sure I'm going to write slide. Yeah. Okay. Did Adonai deliver a prognostication? In Deuteronomy 31, 16, this is what the Lord, he informs Moses this. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. This people will rise and play the harlot with the strange gods of the land into the midst which they are going. And I, they will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them, and I'll hot forsake them and hide my face from them. And it goes on. So that's one thing. Uh, but surely I will hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they will do, uh, it, it, because they turn to other gods. But when I bring them in the, in the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and are satisfied and become prosperous, then they will turn to other gods and serve them, spurn me, and break my covenant. So, did Moses deliver prognostication? The Lord told him, but now Moses is going to reveal the future to the Israelites. Remember, this, these are the, the people of Israel in the plain of Moab, uh, and they're ready to cross into the promised land. So, this is what is said in Deuteronomy 31, 25 and 27. Moses, for I know your rebellion, speak to the children of Israel, for I know your rebellion, your stubbornness. Behold, why I'm still alive with you today, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more than after my death? So he's telling the people of Israel, this is what's going to happen after his death. So if you have your Bibles out, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8. So I'm going to have a template to frame our darash this morning. We're going to look at the, the, present, the past, the present, and the future prognostication that Moses has given to the children of Israel. So the Mosaic prognostication for the Israelites, we're going to look at past historical pivotal events. There we go. We're going to look at present historical events. And we're going to look at future historical pivotal events. So this is our Mosaic. What, what Moses said happened in the past what he's saying is going to be happening now or the near future. And what's going to happen in the far future. So we're going to look at those kind of things. So the significant verbs in this are significant. The first we're going to look at is be careful. I can see this is going to be fun here. Remember to turn this here. Be careful, shamar. Now, I love this because, you know, in, uh, in 8.1, it talks about being careful to observe the commandments. Now, somehow or other, be careful just doesn't cut it with me. I like the Hebrew word shamar. It's the root word there. The semantic range or meaning of shamar means to guard, beware, be circumspect, attend to, take heed, mark out, look narrowly, observe carefully, regard, watch out. It's often translated as keep. But, you know, I don't, I don't like the word keep. You know, for me, to keep is uh, the idea of, well, I keep coins, I keep records, I keep whatever. So it doesn't have a strong enough uh, a meaning for me. So I like the word to guard. And some of, me, some of your versions do have guard. So the first one is be careful. Okay. The second verb we have is to remember. Zakar. 
Zakar, by the way, in my PowerPoint, I have the actual Hebrew. You just have gobbledygook English right now. But I have the actual Hebrew on here. Zakar. The semantic range of meaning includes to remember, to call to mind, to mention, to be mindful, to recount, to record, to think upon, to call remembrance, to acknowledge. Now, why the semantic range of meaning? Because it really fills in the gaps, because sometimes we think of just one word means only one thing, but it has many. So remember is used interchangeably uh, with do not forget along with listen. So remember and do not forget are used a lot in Deuteronomy chapter 8. And these two words are critical verbs used throughout Deuteronomy. Guard is used and remember along with do not forget and listen are all interconnected to mean to observe the Lord's commandments. So this is important to observe. So the idea of listening to guard, to remember, do not forget, are all focused on one thing. Not like some of this, like, oh, I forgot the Lord. I forgot he exists. It's not that intellectual, because most Hebrew verbs have the idea of some action. Some action. So the idea of remember means to don't fail to keep my commandments, my mitzvot. So here's it is, verse 8, verse 11. 8, 11. Beware lest you forget the Lord your God not keep his commandments and his ordinances, his statutes which I'm commanding you this day. Now in Jeremiah, Deuteronomy informs Jeremiah, and he says a lot about not listening or obeying or keeping or guarding Adonai's covenant. In fact, he quotes several times from Deuteronomy. So Deuteronomy really informs uh, 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 Jeremiah. So we have one other one, and this is a noun. Okay. So the noun is he humbled you. The root word there is ana. The semantic range of meaning means to afflict, to abase, to chasten, to deal harshly, along with other applications. If I'm not mistaken, I believe I'm not to afflict the same word used, you shall afflict your souls in, uh, in talking about Yom Kippur. So, and then there's one final, and this is a noun, and this is found in, in Deuteronomy 9, 4, 5, and 6. My or your righteousness, sadaka is the root word there, justice, righteous, blameless. And it describes justice, right actions, and right attitudes as expected from out of eye and people. Usually when we think of righteousness in our world, we, we compare our righteousness with other people. Well, I'm more righteous than this person. But the righteousness here really is referring to right attitudes and actions and justice expected from the Lord and his people. So a man is the object that now describes the attitude of right actions. All right? It's expected of his people. But in chapter 9, it refers to an exalted view of himself as entering the land because of his own righteousness in his eyes. So let's look at some variables which uh, shape their lives and their walk with the Lord. So we're going to look at three areas. We're going to look at past events, present events, and future historical events. So the first thing is resource availability. So take out your Bible, and we'll look at the passage here. So the first one here is past historical events, and we're going to look at, he let you become hungry in verse 3, design scarcity and insecurity. And there's the passage right here. So these are the ones we're looking at here. So the first part of this in Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 6, is talking about design scarcity of resources and security. So let's read uh, Deuteronomy 8, 1 to 6, and then verse 15 to 16. All the commandments which I am commanding you today, you should be careful to do. And there's that word careful, shamar, to guard. Not just be careful, but guard. And then you will live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord your God gave for your inheritance. Now the word possess there in Hebrew has the idea of dispossessing another nation to possess it. So it's like a double edge there. Verse 2. And, when, and you shall remember, there's Zakar, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you from the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you, to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments or not. And look at that, he said he might humble you. So he was purposely humbling them. In verse 3, and he humbled you, the second time he's using humbling, and let you be hungry. What? He let them get hungry? There's a humility part. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know. 
Now, I love the word manna because in Hebrew, when it first appears, it's manhu. What is it? What is it we're eating? He fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know that he might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone, but lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? Of course, in Matthew, uh, in Matthew on the on the the, the at chapter four, when he talks about Yeshua being tempted in the wilderness, since Hasatan had bread, so turning stones into bread, and of course he said, "Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word proceeds from the mouth of God." Now, there's something interesting here, and that is, he said that man does not live by everything. But by bread, but bread alone, but everything that comes out of the mouth of God. I remember in my grandfather's house, he had a plaque that had two of them. One of them was show this elderly man with just a loaf of bread for his supper, and it had this passage on it. Now, it's interesting. He said, man, it's not live by bread alone, but everything proceeds the mouth of God. You know, at this point, and by the way, this entire message, I want you to think of things in your life that seem to be something that we can resonate with and maybe own up, maybe we've, we've slipped shot in this particular area. And during the high holy seasons, particularly when we do the, 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 uh, the liturgy piece, Alchet, for the sin we have sinned before you, we list the sin, that we, if we have some of these issues, maybe we can confess that. So the first thing here is man is not living by bread alone. Isn't it interesting that when you want to have a whole lot, people more inclined to trust in the Lord more. But when you have a refrigerator full of full food, when you have a freezer full of food, when you have money in a bank account, you can say, yeah, I trust the Lord, but really? Or is there more like, well, I have substances available? And so really here he's saying, I've humbled you to remember that you did not have much in the wilderness. Now, let me ask you this question. What did they have in the wilderness to eat? They went to the wilderness. There wasn't much to eat there. And so he fed them with manna. He fed them supernaturally. So the first thing is he fed them manna. That's the first miracle there. He fed them manna. Now this also reminds me that manna is not lived by bread alone, but every word comes from the Father. It also reminds me of one thing. Whenever I, I say the disciples' prayer, for our Father who art in heaven, how be it on thy kingdom come, and then he says, give us this day our daily bread. When I get to that point, remember this daily bread idea, is in, turn if you will, to Proverbs 30. Proverbs 30, because this is a, something I always include in this prayer. Proverbs 30, verse 8, the last line of verse 8. When I'm saying, give us this day our daily bread, feed me with the food that is my portion, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or I be in want and steal and profane the name of my God. See, there's, there's, a, there's a whole range there. If I have too little, I'm to steal and profane his name. But if I have too much, I'm going to say, who's the Lord? I don't remember him. Not that I'm intellectually, but I just don't really trust in him. So it's interesting, that whole gamut there in Proverbs 30. But anyway, he's, so the first miracle, he has food by manna. And then verse 4, the second one is no new clothing or shoes. Your clothing did not wear out in you, nor is your foot swell these 40 years. All right, hands up to those of you who've had the same attire for 40 years, same set of clothes for 40 years. Anyone? Come on, sure. you surely had clothes for 40 years, right? You've never worn nothing but the 40 years clothes, right? No? Running shoes. Shoes. Oh, no, I'm speaking about clothing. You know, I, I collect T-shirts, uh, and one of the things I do is collect T-shirts, and some of them was from our Camp Yeladine. Well, after about five years, I wore them out. It's worn out in my five years. 40 years, your clothes didn't wear out. Is that a miracle? I think so. How about your foot? He said, it didn't swell for these 40 years. I didn't really understand import until I worked at this current job I have. Is that I work as a floral processor in a wholesale florist, and I walk on cement floors. When I first started, I wore a size 10 and a half shoe. Care to guess what I wear today? A 13. My foot has, has swelled. He said, your foot did not swell for 40 years. Can you imagine wearing the same pair of shoes for 40 years? 40 years. That's another miracle. So we've got three miracles right there. That's amazing. So don't forget these things. It's easy to forget those. So it's just another miracle. And then verse 5. Then you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God, he was discipling you as a man disciples his son. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, walk in his ways, and fear him. 
All right, and then we, we're going to look at verses 15 to 16. He led you through. You notice he didn't say he led you around. You know, in our problems, God very often doesn't lead us around problems. We go through them. He led you through the great and terrible wilderness with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground where there was no water. He brought water for you out of the rock of Flint. In the wilderness, he led you. He, he fed you with manna, which your, which your fathers did not know. So this is a personal experience that he might humble you, that he might test you. Now, why? Is this just because he just doesn't like you? Or is there a purpose? Is there an end game here? He humbled you that you might, and he tested you to do good for you in the end. There is a result of the humbling. The result of the humbling. So the first thing we need to see is resource availability in the past historical events is designed scarcity and security. He designed it so there would be scarcity and security in order that you would depend on him. That's the first thing to look at. Well, now, if that's the past, how about the present? The present historical events. The first thing, without scarcity in verse 9, and we see ample provisions of the present security in Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 9. So we went, we went from design scarcity and security to ample provisions today. So they're now looking at ample provisions. So let's look at verse 7 through 9. We'll flip back to 7 and 9. For the Lord your God is bringing, is bringing you, is bringing you as a present into a good land. Now he's going to define a good land. They've been going through this harsh land. Now he's going to bring you into a good land. We went from a land of scarcity, and now he's going to bring you a land of ample provision. The Lord your God is bringing you into a good land. Now he's going to define it four ways. Four ways, this good land. The first way is a good land full of water sources. Now listen, you're going through this desert, and it's tough to find water to drink, Listen to the, by the way, Moses is describing something he's never personally seen. The, the scouts may have seen it. He has personally never witnessed this, but listen to this land, good land. The first way is a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs flowing, with va- flowing in valleys and hills. That's the first thing, a land of water sources. If you're in the desert, you don't have much water source. You can't depend upon any water source. Water sources. Number two, a land of, and now he's going to mention seven species called the seven species. So this is going to be a land of food. A land of wheat, barley, grapes, it says vines, figs, fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil at six, and honey, number seven. A land of abundant food. Thirdly, a land where you can eat food without scarcity. So this is a land of abundance he's leading you into this. And then he says, in which you might lack anything, in which you shall not lack anything. And finally, number four, a land whose stones are iron, and out, out of whose hills you can dig copper. So God is bringing you land four different ways. He says, you've had scarcity over here. Now I'm leading into this land that's full of plenty. It's got water sources. It's got food. It's a land of abundance. It's got minerals and and, and iron and copper so you can make things out of things. So that sounds all good, right? But then we get in verse 10, and we'll read that in the next thing, but I want to say that we first start out with lack, scarcity. Now we're having ample materials. What's going to happen in the near future after they enter the land and after they have eaten and had their fill? We're going to look at future historical events. So we're going to look at you have eaten and are satisfied. This talks about future abundance and future scarcity. So let's look at Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 14. So now we're going to be looking at the future. Beware. Be on guard. Beware, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am uh, commanding you today. And by the way, it says, beware, look at verse 18, but you shall remember. So first you forget, 
And then verse 18, he talks about uh, that you need to remember. Don't forget in verse 11, verse 18, remember the flip side of that, all right? So now verse 11 is an interesting passage because what that speaks of is when, when he uses the word forget, when you forget the Lord, it's not talking about an intellectual forgetting. It's talking about forget by not keeping his commandments. It's the same with the word listening. The word listening uh, as saints, it says the same thing. You will not listen means you will not observe. And it's interesting that in Jeremiah and Deuteronomy have this in common. The words remember, the words forget, the words not keep, the words not listening are used in both all throughout Deuteronomy and Jeremiah. In fact, in Jeremiah, you could say that the whole book is about not listening, not remember. In Deuteronomy, it's warning not to do that. Yeah, we see in Jeremiah, it's exactly what happened. All right, so we see here in verse 11 to 14, we've read verse 11, now 12, Lest when you have eaten, I love this. This is interesting. This is just so us. When you have eaten, and you are satisfied. You have built good houses. You lived in them. And when you own cars, homes, yachts, ad infinitum, CDs, full bank accounts, and lived in them, verse 13, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, your silver and your gold multiply, and all you have multiplies. What's the danger here? Verse 14. Then your heart becomes proud or lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God. Remember, forget means you forget to do his commandments. You're not doing them. You forget the Lord your God. So we go from scarcity in, verse, in, in, in previous verses to plenty to now abundance. But with abundance often comes forgetfulness. We start to forget where we came from. Never forget where you came from, particularly if you've made some success. Because you're being humbled early. And now it's really easy to depend about what you have and to say, I don't need the Lord as much. Think about, and this is not a, this is not a political message at all, but think about this nation when we, were, when we first got started. We had to depend more on the Lord. And then now it's increasing secularism. Now people are saying, well, who's the Lord? Who's the Lord? Even among would be Yeshua followers, who's the Lord? There's a danger when you have prosperity or abundance, let's just say you have enough, of forgetting where you came from. He said, your heart, verse 14, becomes proud and you forget the Lord your God. Now listen to what he says here. Who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Remember you were formerly slaves in the future? Remember you were slaves? It's interesting. Remember what Lord Acton said about the past? It said, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. It's interesting that he says about he brought you out of the house of slavery. What happened at the end of the monarchy, the United Monarchy? What happened when Jeremiah said, you keep on doing this, you're going to be kicked out of the land, you're going to be exiled? They were exiled to Babylon as slaves. Remember you came and you were Egyptian slaves? The danger in the future is they're going to be slaves again, only this time in Babylon. Remember your past. Remember the Lord who brought you out of the house of slavery. And I think this is a very, very instruction here. Don't, don't forget your past. So the first thing we looked at is resource availability. The things that we, we possess that are important for us. The next one we're going to look at is a source of dependency. Right? From the past, we have is he lets you become hungry. Man does not live by bread alone. We see there's a dependency upon the Lord alone. And we see this here in Deuteronomy 8, 3 to 6 and 16. All right, so if your Bibles look at 3, back to 8, 3. We first look at uh, of, of, uh, resources in 3. He humbled you and let you be hungry and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor your fathers knew. He might make you understand that man does not live by bread alone. That speaks of dependency upon God. There's a dependency when you're younger, uh, when you haven't made it yet, or if you're, in, you're needing a food and things like that sort, you're dependent. You learn dependency upon God. However, in the present, you have another problem that we, we face, and that is we start getting enough resources available, and we no longer as it's dependent. Therefore, you shall walk in his ways and fear him. This speaks of present dependency for success. And that's found in Deuteronomy 6 to 7. So if you look at verse 6 and 7. Deuteronomy 8, 6 to 7. Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God 
to walk in his ways, to fear him. Now, this is important, to walk in his ways and to fear him. One of the problems Israel had when they went into the promised land is they stopped walking. They stopped walking with the Lord. They stopped fearing him. In fact, as we're going to see in a few minutes, what Jeremiah was saying in his book, in the prophetic book years later, was the fact that they forgot to walk in his ways. They no longer feared him. Now, we'd like to quick say, well, fear doesn't mean fear or trembling. It just means rever- reverential fear. Be careful, because even reverential fear, there are some elements of fear. You don't go to your employee late every day, right? And you don't just like do things while he's watching. There's a little bit of fear there. But Israel had stopped the fearing the Lord later on in its history. And Moses was saying, you know, you've already had, you, you, you've been fearing over here. You feared when you, when you came to the Mount Sinai and you had the ten words given to you. You're now fearing me now, but be careful in the future you don't walk in his ways. You don't fear him. And that's instruction for us. We have to be careful that the longer we walk, we can take God for granted. And so now we're going to look at the future pivotal events. And now he's going to give us instruction what's going to happen in the future when we decide, you know, I don't need God as much. I'm not a, I don't need to be dependent upon him. Beware lest you forget the Lord your God and your heart becomes proud. This speaks of dependency from God. You become independent now in Deuteronomy 8.11. So we see here that we now worry about becoming independent. It's interesting how we think we're independent of God the more we have. It's very easy to do that. So let's look at 8.11. Beware lest you forget the Lord your God by keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. When you have eaten and are satisfied, we talked about that. Drop down verse 14. Your heart becomes proud and forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Continue on. He says here, he led you through the great and terrible wilderness and its scorpions. So, if, so here, it's really speaking about beware that your heart doesn't become proud and you forget. You depend upon God over here when times were rough through the wilderness. You're depending on God now. You're right here. To, you're ready to cross the land. Finally, years later, the problem is we might not be as dependent as we once were. And I said that, that this is really interesting because we can say we're dependent upon God, but the proof is that our actions and what we rely on trust on. So we're going to look at one other here, which is accountability to remember. Accountability to remember. From the past, remember, do not forget. That's Deuteronomy 8.2 and 8.14. This is remember, don't forget. In 8.2, again, we're looking at accountability. You shall remember all the way your Lord brought you. You shall remember there's accountability. You know, when you remember something, you're holding yourself accountable. You know, I, I like what, what, uh, what Moses was saying in Deuteronomy 6, uh, Shema, you're to, you're, to put the, you're to bind them as signs upon your hands and upon your forehead. These are signs help us to remember. We hold ourselves accountable. When you see the zitziot on your, on your, on your talit, they're reminding you. They're a reminder to us, and then we're held accountable. One of the problems in our society is no one's accountable to anything anymore. It's someone else's fault. It's not mine. Holding yourself accountable. So in terms of holding yourself accountable, we need to make sure that in the present, that we're, in the past, you were remember. They had to then. Now, the, the, the present, the present historical pivotal events are as following. Keep in mind or know in your heart. Deuteronomy 8.5. So if you look at Deuteronomy 8.5. Thus you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you as a man disciplines his son. So all this humbling way over here in the past was disciplining you. We disciplined our children. And discipline doesn't have the necessary, the harshness. It's training them up. It's training them in the ways of the Lord. So you're to remember, and you're to be held accountable by keep in mind that God was disciplining you over here. And he's disciplining you now. So to remember or keep in mind in 8.5 has the idea again, keep in mind that the Lord was disciplining you. And when he's disciplining you, you learn new things and you're held accountable for what you know. 
And finally, in the future events, we have the following. Remember, or remember your source, and this is Deuteronomy 8.18. So let's look at verse 18. Deuteronomy 8.18. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you the power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant. So let's go back up here in 17. It says, otherwise you may say in your heart after you've prospered and all that, that my power and my strength in my hand has enabled me for this wealth. Verse 18, but you shall remember the Lord your God as he who has given you the power to make wealth. And you know, here's a problem in the future. In the future, the problem's going to be is when you look back toward the present or, or the past, there's a tendency to minimize God and maximize me, my power, my authority, my knowledge, my strength. Wait a minute. It was he who led you through here. The real danger here in the future, Moses is saying, is one day you're going to come to a point where you're going to think, I don't need the Lord. My power, my strength got me where I am for the past. Which is you to remember what God did in the past. And don't, don't minimize God and maximize you maximize the Lord and minimize you because as he is the one who led you through these terrible events that he humbled you. Now we're going to look at the moral attitude, humility or pride. Again, you notice we're using the same scriptures because Deuteronomy is absolutely filled with lessons for us to learn. So the moral attitude. By the way, you know, particularly this verse, I thought about just reading the passages and say, okay, amen. It teaches itself, doesn't it? You don't really need me up here to say this. I mean, this, is say, this, you, this teaches itself. It's, this preaches itself. It's incredible. It's so good. It actually does it itself. So the, the next one, point four, is a moral attitude, humility, or pride. So in the past, we're going to look at he humbled you. He might make you learn. God was disciplining you. So, and verse 2 again, chapter 8, 2 to 3. And you should remember all the way the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness, these quarters, that he might humble you. He might, verse 8, 3, he might make you understand. And verse 5 of 8, 5, he, that he was disciplining you. So there's humility or pride. You know, he humbled you initially over here. It's a good thing humility comes before, uh, humility comes before you, you gain your understanding and then Pride, you, you fall because you don't have the humility. But the idea here is he humbled you. There is humility. He might make you learn or understand. There's humility over here. Never discount the hard days and days in which you're learning because they really work well in the future. Well, the present. And by the way, if you look at uh, verse 16 of Deuteronomy 8, let's look at uh, Deuteronomy 8, 16 for a minute. It says here in verse 16, that in the wilderness he fed you manna, which your fathers did not know. He might humble you, that he might test you to do good for you in the end. So the humility was, the, was for a purpose, to bring you to the land for all the good in the land. Now, in the, in the present, is to walk in his ways and to fear him. In 8.6, you're to walk in his ways and fear him. Okay, And that's found here in Deuteronomy 8.6. Back in 8.6, Therefore shall keep the, the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways to fear him. There, if you're walking before him and you're fearing him, there's not going to be any room for pride, is there? If you're walking with him, halacha, you're doing a walk with the Lord, and you fear him, yare, you're fearing him, there's going to not be any room for pride, is there? Because if you're walking, imagine what happened to our lives. If we're walking our daily life, you, shoot, you can see Yeshua walk right here. He's walking beside you. How much room is there for pride? How much room is there for fear? Lots of room for that. And fear means reverence, respect, etc. You know the thing we should really fear when we walk with the, with the Lord with Yeshua? We don't want to disappoint him. That's really what I think of when I think of fearing him. Not wanting to disappoint him. And so that's a real issue for us is pride and humility. Uh, if we're walking before him, if we're fearing him, we, we will not be prone for pride. You notice what I have on the, on, the, on the screen there. Know before whom you stand. I absolutely love this. I love this passage. I mean, I love this idea 
but no before you stand. What I'm referring to that is in, in many synagogues above the Bema, and where the Ark is. They will have, above the uh, Roan, they will have, you say right above it, know before whom you stand. I absolutely love that because we forget that. It's easy to walk through life and not know before whom you stand. So the idea of walking and fearing him in the present as well as the future. And then finally, the future historical events. If your heart becomes proud, and that's the real issue that we have to watch about in the future, is your heart becomes proud. It's like a 13, 14. And when your herds and your flocks multiply and all you have multiply your silver and gold, then your heart becomes proud and you forget the Lord your God. That's when the pride comes in, when we forget to follow his commandments, when we start imagining that we are the ones who have accumulated all this wealth. So that's the moral attitude. Fifthly, the acoustical ability to listen to God or not. So the first thing we'll look at here, and I'll just do this first, is we're going to look at to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commandments or not. So it's the idea of knowing what's in your heart, and that's in Deuteronomy 2, 5 to 6. It says, know in your heart whether or not you would keep his commandments or not. Will you keep them or not? So our, our ability to listen, are we willing to listen first, and then are we listening to listen or not? The present, lest you forget by not keeping his commandments, which I'm commanding today, forgetting, not obeying, stem from not listening, not but rebelling. So again, uh, Jeremiah had a lot to say about this. So our present, we need to make sure that we're not forgetting currently, but we're currently walking with the Lord and fearing him. And in the future, if you ever forget by not obeying or listening to the Lord, and that's in Deuteronomy 8, 8 19. So if you look at that, we'll find something else interesting for our instruction. So if you ever forget by not listening to the Lord, Look over here in verse 19. It shall come about that if you ever forget the Lord your God and go after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you today that you will surely perish. Like the nations that the Lord God had made to perish before you, you shall perish because you did not listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Now that's interesting. If you ever forget by not obeying, not forget intellectually, but forget by obeying, you will perish. Now, remember I said earlier, I gave a, a, a heads up about listening. I want to show you what happened in, in Jeremiah. Uh, there's a, is it the future ability to listen or to not? Now, recently I had an MSI class on Jeremiah that I taught. And I absolutely loved Jeremiah. I mean, he had a way of really writing here. Now, the future ability to listen or not, we're going to look at several of these passages I've got here on the screen, so don't worry, you don't have to turn to them. In Jeremiah 5.21, now listen to the word listen, or hear. 5.21, now listen to this, O foolish and senseless people, who have ears or have eyes do not see, who have ears but do not hear. And now because you've done all these things, declares the Lord, I spoke to you, rising up early and speaking, but you did not hear, you didn't listen. I called, but you didn't answer. That's a sad statement. But this is what I commanded them, saying, Obey my voice. I will be your God. And you will be my people. You will walk in the way which I command you that it may be well with you. Yet they did not obey or incline their ear. Since the day of your fathers came out of the land of Egypt until this day, I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, rising daily and early, sending them. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck, did more evil than their fathers. Listen and give heed. Do not be haughty. For the Lord has spoken. Yet they did not listen or climb the ears, but stiffen their necks in order not to listen or take correction. And in this last verse, I put this in for last because this is where we're at, I think, lots of times. I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said I will not listen. This has been your practice from your youth that you have not obeyed my voice. Here's what I think is interesting. God says, I spoke to you way over here. I spoke to you and had everything going for you. You had plenty. You had abundance. You had resources. You had it all stockpiled, building bigger houses and bigger, bigger cars and bigger everything over here. I spoke to you in prosperity. But I didn't listen. I didn't listen. I didn't listen to the Lord's word. I didn't listen. I forgot. I failed to forget the Lord by keeping his commandments. 
I allowed other things to come into my life and crowd out reading the Word of God. Too many things happen over in my prosperity. I don't prosper. I just mean if you have a bun, if you have enough to eat, you feed. Okay. I spoke to you and had everything over here, but the crowd, crowds, and, and the world has crept in, and now you don't have time to read the Word of God. I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to go to congregations. I don't have time to meet your MSI class. I don't have time. We've allowed the world to crowd us out. If we're not careful, he's saying, make sure that you're listening in your prosperity. That's where we're at here, I think, many of us in this world. We have all these things clamoring. There's a cacophony of sounds, a cacophony of desires saying, hey, pay attention to this. Pay attention to that. We're all going to be ADD one of these days. <laughs> we need to focus narrowly. Listen to what God has said in your prosperity, in the time which you have enough. By the way, it doesn't have to be in your prosperity. You could actually be, he could have just easily said, I spoke to you in your poverty. Because sometimes the same thing happens. I got to get all this out over here. I don't have time to listen to God. The point is, I spoke to you, but you didn't listen. In other words, you didn't incline your ear to obey. And the first part is you have to know what God said in the first place, which means we have to read here, in, in, in ancient days, you heard the word rather than read it so much in the common people. To hear or to listen or to read. So paying attention, listening to God is so critical here. So I spoke to you in prosperity, but you would not listen. So then there's a faulty thinking. These are self-imaging defects. These are what happens when you start thinking big about yourself. So the past event... We must be seen like grasshoppers to them. Okay. So the first is what happened in the past. In the past, we have something interesting here. We have a diminished view of ourselves. And this, I have a passage here, but we're not going to really read it for sake of time. But Numbers thirteen thirty three. Remember, when they sent the the twelve scouts. They're not spies. They're really scouts. Twelve scouts, and they came back to the other land's great. Oh, but the giants of the land, all these horrible things. And he said, we must have seen like grasshoppers in their, eye, in their eyes, and we, we ourselves saw ourselves as grasshoppers. You know what the problem was? Their God was too small and their enemy too big. Compare that later off with David, with David, King David. You remember the story of Goliath? Goliath? Remember what he said? Well, shoot, Goliath is so big, I can't possibly miss him. His God was so big, and Goliath was so small. There's a self-imaging problem if we're not careful. There's a self-imaging. There's a faulty thinking in the past. We must have seemed like grasshoppers to them. But he's going to warn you, you could do the same thing here in the present. And, and what happens is in Deuteronomy 7, 17, and we will look at that, we will see that in Deuteronomy 7, we're going to see the same kind of a thing showed up here. And that is wrong fear. So the, in, in Numbers 13, in the past event, the wrong focus, I am too small. Well, in the present, it's the wrong fear, man rather than God. You're fearing men rather than God. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7. Flip back to Deuteronomy 7, if you would. Deuteronomy 7, 17, 21. If you should say in your heart, we're getting ready to pass over in the present. If you should say in your heart, these nations are greater than I, how can I dispossess them? then you shall not be afraid of them. You shall well remember what the Lord your God did to the Pharaoh and to all Egypt. The great trials which your eyes saw and the signs and wonders of the mighty hand, the outstretched arm of which the Lord your God has brought you out. So shall the Lord your God do to all these people whom you are afraid. So the idea is make sure you don't say in your heart, I, I can't do it. Back then I can't do it. Don't have that same attitude, I can't do it. That's the problem. And then there's a problem with the future. In the future event, what we have is do not say in your heart because of my power and strength and my right hand. So in the future, we have another problem, and that is a self-imaging problem in the other direction, which is saying, do not say in your heart because of my power and strength and my righteousness. Look at 817. And 817, otherwise... You may say in your heart in the future, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. This is a wrong imagination. I'm able. You have pride there. 
you go from, and there's a wrong imagination. So the wrong focus in the past is, I am too small. In the present, the wrong fear, man, you're fearing man rather than God. In the future, it's a wrong imagination. I am able, I'm, I'm, I get pride. Now, we would never, here's the thing that's interesting about us. You know, when people ask me, why do you, I had my, my employer once asked me, do you read this Bible every day? Like, why would you want to do that? It's just a bunch of old, dusty things. I said, I, you know what I told him? I said, this book is more up to date than the front page of your headline newspaper. This is more up to date than the internet news you get right now. You know, how? I said, you're thinking this is a history book or geography book or a science book. It's none of that. This is a book of human nature. It doesn't change. We all are doing the same things our forefathers did. The same kinds of things. That's why it's up to date. So we need to be careful that we don't read this and go, ha, ha, why, why those Israelites? I can't believe that they did all this. All oh, this terrible. Well, meanwhile, you're puffing, puffing out your, your, your chest. I can't believe they did all that stuff. Be careful. We do the same kinds of things. We'd never call it pride, would we? No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not proud. It's like when they ever you see the show, uh, The Hoarders. You ever see that we're hoarders? They said, when did you start hoarding? Oh, I don't hoard. Ooh. It could be the same as the rest. Oh, when did you start getting proud? I'm not proud. We don't say it, but our actions say otherwise. And so the problem with a self-imaging problem in the future, Moses is saying, is there's a tendency for us to start thinking, you know, we start taking credit. Oh, look at this. You start taking credit for what God has done in your past. Let me say that again, because I think that's probably we might run into. We take credit for what God has done in the past. And then... Number seven, there's unfinished business in the land. Unfinished business in the land. And so we're going to look at the past, the unfinished business, and we're going to look at these items right here. So from the past, we have unfinished business. Let's look at 13. We don't have to look at it. It's right here in the text. In 1331 of Numbers, it says, the land does flow with milk and honey, but we're not able to go in. The land does have the milk and honey. We see it. So there is a land full of milk and honey. But they were not able to go in. The land was not taken. In the present, we see that God is bringing to a good land, a land for which the Lord your God cares for. Now, let's look at Deuteronomy 11. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 11. We're going to read more about the land. This is fascinating since Moses has never entered the land to begin with. At least not until... Transfiguration in Matthew 17. Okay, and uh, let's look at 11. Chapter 11, 10 through 12. For the land in which you are going to enter to possess is not like the land of Egypt from which you came where you needed to sow your seed and water water it with the foot like a vegetable garden. So you took the foot and made like a treadmill kind of a thing for the water to come. But the land in which you are about to cross to possess is a land of hills and valleys drinks water from the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord your God cares. The eyes of the Lord your God are always on it from the beginning even to the end of the season. Wow. That's the land they're going into. So you might think, well, okay, good. How's this? The land is still pending. But what about the future? Do they finally get the land? Um, I don't think so. And so what we have here in the, in the, the, uh, the present, of course, is pending. But now in the future, we have this. The land is not fully possessed. We won't read through it, but I have some quotes on here from, from Joshua 13.1. The Lord said to him, to Joshua, very much the land remains to be possessed. And then Judges 1.20-29, they did not draw it out, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Termites, etc. So all these groups, if they not dry it out, the land is not fully possessed. So he's saying, make sure to take the land over here we're not able. That's in the past. In the present, okay, God's going to bring us in. Maybe we will take them out. In the future, you should be, but they didn't. They, they did not rely upon the Lord. They did not drive out all the people of the land. That became a problem. Finally, number eight is at, gratitude versus entitlement. I think this really may be in our society today. Attitude, so we we'll took up the past. Okay, So, he brought water for you out of the rock. He fed you with manna to do good to you in the end, in 8.16. He, 
The attitude is, it, it was, unfortunately, back then, grumbling and sporadic thanksgiving. In the past, they would say, we want water. And they grumbled rather than, than asking. And they finally get, there was some, there was some gratitude. It said, spring up all well, you know, and other things like that. Like they're gracious that, that they had this. Or they had a cultivated an attitude. So I call it sporadic thanksgiving and praise. Sporadic, very sporadic. In the present, we have this. We have the Lord is bringing you into a good land. You shall bless the Lord for the good land. Now, I find that interesting. You notice what he says, uh, look at verse 7, chapter 8. He says here in 8, 7, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of waters and fountains and hills. And then verse 10, When you have eaten and when you are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. So the point is that here we need to make sure we operate on the attitude of blessing. And so you shall bless the Lord. When he brings you in, bless the Lord. That's the appropriate response when he gives us something is to bless the Lord. And that sounds like but we need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude. This is important because if we don't have an attitude of gratitude over here in the, in the, over here in the past when things weren't so well, when we, don't, when we aren't grateful, we don't thank the Lord for what we have, how are we ever going to thank for him in the present and the future if we're not being gracious with what we've got now? Very important. So in the future, what we have here is we have a possibility of entitlement, don't we? We have a problem with entitlement. We have, as in verse 18, is he who is giving you the power to make wealth that may confirm his covenant, 18. And the attitude is indifference or entitlement. And here's, and this is very interesting. Look at 817 for a minute in 18. Otherwise, when you say your heart and your heart, my power and my strength and love my hand made me this wealth. But you should remember there's a Lord your God is he who's giving you the power to make wealth to confirm his covenant. Now look at chapter 9, the very next chapter, and look at verse 4. Now he's just saying as soon as you enter the land, you've been there for a while, here's a problem. Do not say in your heart if you've taken the land, when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, well, it's because of my righteousness. That's it. It's because of my righteousness. The Lord has brought me in to possess this land. And it's because, and then he says, it's because of my righteousness. So we make the mistake over here. We, over here we say, in that feature, you know, it's because of my righteousness that God has gained me all this blessing. Because of my, what I did. What does he say to, to rebut that? It is not because of your righteousness. It is because of their wickedness. And he goes on to say, because you are a stiff-necked people. The problem we can have today in our, in our world is we can have a sense of entitlement. You know, it's interesting. We would never say that. But it's easy to have a sense of entitlement over here. The reason, God owes it to me. In fact, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Rabbi Stewart, Stewart Dowerman, had an interesting darash where he talked about that in our society, we're having this, God is a part of my team. He helps me find a parking lot. And we've domesticated God. Or we think we have. We've domesticated God. He's part of my team. He's this party of this political party. He's the God of this party. Or he will take care of me over here. I anticipate, we've seen in the COVID-19 about people who refuse to wear a mask saying, well, God will protect me. We've seen all kinds of things where we think God entitles us for all these blessings. And that is a real dangerous place. I would call that presumption. So be very careful about how we look at our future in terms of gratitude versus entitlement. Uh, we're only like halfway through my PowerPoint. We're going to be about done here. But I do want to circumvent this and say this. Paul talks about we ought to be having a spirit of thanksgiving. Give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. But he said, in everything, give thanks. We need to cultivate praise and thanksgiving. When we realize that we are dependent upon him for everything, where is there a sense of entitlement for us? How do we earn entitlement? We don't. But it can creep in our life. We live in society now where we think that we're entitled. You know, the government owes us money for whatever. We've slipped into that mode here in this country here. It's easy since we're, we're living in the world, not of the world, but to allow the world to creep into our lives. So we need to avoid the idea of this idea of entitlement. 
to us. So those eight things I thought we'd re- look at today, all of these really speak of the past, the present, and the future. So hey, I was wondering, did I give any in- information here that you might be able to take home with you to say, you know what? Hmm, maybe I've kind of ship- slipshod in this area of my life. Let's get it right. because We're right around the corner of, of Rosh Hashanah or Yom Truah and the Days of Awe and Yom Kippur. Let's think of these issues and see if we can actually do them and finish them up. So let's close with a word of prayer. Avinu Makenu, our Father, our King, as we've, look, as we've looked at Deuteronomy 8 and 9 and other passages, we have seen that Moses was given a prognostication of what's going to happen of the past, from the present, and the dangers of the future. In order for the people to, to look at their lives, to examine it, to examine their lives and make sure that they are in line with keeping and walking in the way of the Lord, fearing Him and keeping His commandments. Fathers, if there's any areas in our lives that, that's been exposed today, may we come and confess them before you, and may we, may we make right, may we actually come for you and receive forgiveness. Father, may we, when we chant the al- Alchet, for the sin we have sinned before you, that, Father, that we can remember some things that maybe from this lesson or for other lessons that we've heard, that we might get it right. We do not want to carry unconfessed sin in our lives. So, Father, I pray you would cleanse us, that we'd forsake them, and you would cleanse us not only from just our sin, but all unrighteousness, all, all moral uncleanliness. And, Father, as we get ready to enjoy the high holy season, may we be a people that have had our hearts clean and that, Father, we have hearts of gratitude and that we remember our past, which informs our present and which gives us hope for the future. And we pray all these things in the blessed name of Yeshua the Messiah. And everyone said,